We've all been there, opening the drawer of an antique or vintage sewing machine and finding a mess of confusing metal bits with no explanation as to what they are, what they're designed to do, or how they're designed to do it. Greetings and welcome to 24 Washington. Now, I know there are quite a few videos out there going over various sewing machine attachments, so I did try to set myself a challenge to create a video that would not just be a repeat of all the others. As such, this video will cover some of the most common sewing machine attachments that I've found in manuals and not only provide an identification, but also explain how to use them. I personally have attachments dating back to the 1800s. They are stored in wooden puzzle boxes, metal tins, cardboard boxes, and then there's the modern makeup case full of extras. Over the years, Singer changed both the attachments that were offered with their machines, along with the actual design of some of them. So, where applicable, I will show you some of the differences in designs from the late 1800s to the mid 1900s, and also show you how some of the attachments might appear if they have come apart. Hopefully, this video will allow you to not only identify, but also put to use any of the machine attachments that you might currently have or may encounter in the future. We will go over these items in the order that I feel is from the least complicated to the most. But first, here is an identification of the attachments you're most likely to find. Press a foot, which is normally found on the machine. Seam edge guide. Quilter, bias gauge, binder, ruffler, tuck marker or tucker, hemmer, and adjustable hemmer. The presser foot is used for everyday stitching. Some varieties are fixed. Some are hinged to more easily accommodate increases or decreases in fabric thickness. The function is to apply pressure onto your fabric so that when the feed dogs rise and advance, your fabric is also advanced in order to receive the next stitch. Whenever changing out attachments, not only must you raise the presser bar that the attachment is mounted to, but you must also raise your needle to the highest point before removing and replacing them. This is to ensure that the needle is out of the way and not likely to get caught on any of the attachments. The purpose of the seam edge guide is to ensure a uniform stitch line from the edge of your fabric to a predetermined distance. It screws down to the bed of the machine and can be slid nearer to or further from the needle before being fully tightened. When running fabric through your machine, Allow it to pass comfortably against the guide and you can be sure of a consistent seam width. Later, needle plates were made with imprinted measures, allowing you to visually gauge your seam allowance and doing away with some of the need for this attachment. However, if you are running a large volume of fabric through, this guide means that you don't have to watch it like a hawk. Or is that an eagle? To create successive parallel lines spanning across a piece of fabric, we must turn to the quilting foot. It is not unlike the edge guide in that it too allows you to define a set distance to your stitch line. But because the marker follows the previous stitch line rather than the fabric edge, the only limit is the space under your machine. The quilting attachment comprises two parts, what is effectively a modified presser foot, and an adjustable marker guide, which can be inserted and used on either side of the needle. The foot itself is designed to allow the fabric to move more freely underneath than a regular foot. In this example, I formed a diamond quilted pattern. I used my regular presser foot to form the initial crossed stitch lines, which had been pre-marked with chalk, and I then set the marker distance as I wished and used it to follow my initial lines. To form each subsequent row, I positioned the most recent stitch line under the marker guide. Despite having never done any quilting myself, and trying to keep the stretchier bias grain of the fabric under control, I was still able to obtain an accurate result without the need for copious marking lines. 
The bias gauge provides a convenient way to cut bias strips in sizes from 7 16th of an inch to 1 and 3 8 of an inch. Bear in mind that tools like rotary cutters, which can cut bias strips quickly and accurately, weren't produced until around 1980, whereas this tool was around 100 years earlier. The design of the bias gauge didn't change over its production. The only thing that did change were the locations of the markings. F represents the recommended width for facings, B for bindings, and C for cording. Particularly pertinent with the next attachment is the width for bindings. In the late 1800s, documentation recommends that a bias strip width of 13 sixteenths of an inch be used with the binding tool. However, by the 1930s at least, the printed instructions recommend a 15 sixteenths of an inch width instead. Bias strips should be cut on the true diagonal so that the stretch or ease on both sides is the same. To get started, mark a line in this direction and cut it. The gauge slips over the pointed end of your scissors like this. It should be noted that I am left-handed. This gauge is designed for right-handed individuals. Were I right-handed, I could support the fabric with my left hand whilst cutting it with my right, but alas, this is not the case, and reaching over the scissors to support the strip isn't very comfortable. We lefties struggle on. The fabric goes into the gauge up to the indicator. You make small, even cuts following the indicator. If you were to make large, long cuts, the base of the fabric could end up being wider or narrower than intended, leaving you with an uneven strip. You must also be very careful not to stretch the fabric, as this too can cause unevenness. One consideration noted in documentation is the weight of your binding fabric. Lightweight and flimsy fabrics might require a wider strip, as they are more prone to stretching even with delicate handling. The binder accessory had perhaps the most variation of all. Its function is to take a strip of fabric placed around the outside, roll the outer edges into the middle, and then stitch the newly folded edges in place, either on its own as a drawstring or over fabric as binding. To get started, cut the tip of your bias strip to a point to make the initial feeding easier. Slot it through the outside of the tool and, using light pressure, advance it through. You can use a stiletto tool or long pin to help move it along. As you can imagine, when used on the machine, the stitch would lock the rolled edges in place. The binder started as an add-on that could be interchanged with various hemming bits. It was then produced as a complete item on its own, with an adjustment screw to allow the location of the stitch to be adjusted from the edge of the binding. Later versions looked quite formidable, doing away with an adjustment screw and replacing it with an adjustment slide, providing multiple slots for a variety of different commercially produced pre-folded binding widths, along with a scroll for unfolded strips. It also included an edge guide for piping, and some guide pins to help keep your binding materials from tangling. The side was conveniently marked with a 15 16th measure to check that your unfolded bias strips were, in fact, the correct size. The added benefit of the later models of binder is that you can pass multiple widths of binding through the attachment simultaneously, allowing for some rather lovely piping style effects, as I will demonstrate. After you've attached the binder, leave the presser bar up as you feed the binding or bias strip through. It is recommended that you cut your binding to a point in order to more easily feed it through the binder. A stiletto tool can be used to assist in advancing the binding until it is well under the needle. You can bind inside and outside curves, Opening plackets, closed seams, and open seams. You can bind corners, scallops, make button loops and button openings. 
and you can add rickrack braid or other trimmings on top of the fabric that you wish to bind, giving a more elaborate finish to your edge. Another suggestion I've come across is to use the binder to create a lattice effect on top of your fabric. You can also sew this lattice onto paper, which, when torn away, will provide a rather stunning insertion piece. Due to the screw present in earlier models of the binder, it is not uncommon to find this attachment in pieces. In this case, it might appear like this. Fitting the ruffler isn't as straightforward as some other attachments, as you must slot the actuating fork over the needle screw at the same time as slotting the gripping fork over the presser bar, all while being careful to avoid catching your needle. I have found the best success slipping it in from the side and then clamping it in place. While the ruffler had some modifications since its 1800s debut, its overall design has remained mostly the same. An arm on the ruffler slots over the needle clamp screw. As the needle moves up and down, a toothed metal blade is moved back and forth. When it slides forwards, the teeth engage with the fabric, advancing it to a point just past the needle. A second blade is located at the bottom, which not only allows the fabric to be moved smoothly, but also prevents the teeth of the top blade from coming into direct contact with the feed dogs. The feed dogs could bend, snap, or otherwise damage the teeth. There is an adjustment mechanism on all of the rufflers I own, allowing the depth of the ruffle to be altered. Later versions were fitted with a sprung adjustment lever that allowed the user to deactivate the ruffling feature completely, which is useful if you are creating a set number of pleats at a specific interval. You can choose between one ruffle every stitch, one ruffle every five stitches, or one ruffle every one, six, or twelve stitches. The version of ruffler I'm using is one of the more recent variations. The star indicates that the ruffler is disengaged, so it just stitches regularly. 12 indicates one ruffle per 12 stitches, 6 one ruffle per 6 stitches, and finally one with every stitch. This piece of fabric I'm using here is just a quickly ripped strip. The material to be ruffled should be placed between the lower separator blade and the toothed ruffling blade. If you wish to ruffle a strip of fabric or lace onto another piece of fabric, that second piece of fabric should be placed completely underneath of the attachment. The slotted guides on the left can help keep everything aligned. The width of material that you can ruffle is determined by the size of the ruffler. You cannot ruffle anything extending to the right by more than an inch or so. Stepping away from the machine for a moment, Singer understood that their customers might wish to use the ruffler to create shearing in consecutive rows over a distance exceeding one inch, so the metal edge to the right can be removed on attachments with a screw or turned back on attachments with a hinged rivet. But you must, must, must use a specially designed shearing plate that will look like one of these because if the teeth of the ruffling blade catch on the feed dogs, they could be damaged beyond repair. To use the ruffler, you simply draw the material slightly to the back of the needle, lower the presser bar, and proceed to sew. To make a finer gather, you shorten the stroke of the ruffling blade by backing out the regulating screw and shorten your stitch length. To make a fuller gather, you do the opposite, driving in the screw and increasing your stitch length. You can ruffle trim directly onto fabric by placing the receiving fabric fully underneath of the attachment. You can also add trimming on top of the ruffling by running the trim over the top of the ruffler blade and through the guide. The tuck marker is a device which uses a spur and groove arrangement to mark creases into the fabric at a designated distance from the needle. This marks the next tuck fold without having to use a ruler and draw lines. There are two adjustment options on this accessory, the tuck width and the tuck spacing. The width of the tuck is determined by the scale of figures nearest the needle, 
which shows the distance of the folded edge from the stitch line in eighths and sixteenths of an inch. The distance of the crease or mark which will form the subsequent fold line is determined by the scale nearest the operator and this is set by the line in front of the needle hole in the presser foot. For blind tucks, that is, tucks without spaces, set both scales to the same number. To make spaces between the tucks, move the front scale further to the left until the desired space is obtained. To start making tucks, fold the material and crease by hand. Have the fabric oriented so that your additional tucks will run sequentially over the top of the fabric and to the left. Pass the folded edge directly above the lowest blade nearest you, that is to say, over the spur, then between the two blades of the second scale and back under the presser foot. Slide the edge securely to the right against the guide and lower the presser bar. Make sure that the needle clamp will strike the marking lever in order to form a crease for the next tuck, then proceed with sewing the first tuck. For the second tuck, fold the fabric carefully at the crease made by the spur and place the edge of the first tuck underneath and against the spur at the left. The spur will serve as a guide and will also make a distinct crease for the next tuck. Always place the last tuck against the spur to ensure perfect work. If you're using a tucker with the option to disengage the mechanism used to make creases, you will want to do this when you're making your final tuck. This way, you won't have any unnecessary creases to iron out when completed. This accessory takes the edge of a piece of fabric and folds it over twice to produce a fine 1 8 inch hem. The slot toward the rear of the attachment allows lace or other pre-finished trim to be sewn on at the same time as the hemming operation. I would like to share that while this attachment works very well on straight cut edges, I have personally found it very difficult when working with curves due to the tendency for the fabric to stretch or distort. The manuals suggest that you can use paper underneath of a curved hem for stabilization and to prevent rolling, but at the time of this video, I have not had much success with that. Also very important to note, because of the space around this ribbon of steel which forms the scroll, it is entirely possible that it could become caught on something and therefore subsequently misaligned. If you try to use this tool and find that no matter how precisely you measure, your seams are untidy, you might need to replace it. It is critical to start the hem correctly because any pulling of this straight of grain of the fabric will very likely result in a less than perfect hem. With your foot hemmer in place, take your fabric and for the first inch or two, finger press the double eighth inch hem so that's up one eighth inch and then over again by the second eighth inch. The manuals provide a recommended method for starting the hem, but I have found myself needing a third hand when I try to follow their instructions, so here's what I do, try to follow along. Use a stiletto tool, a long pin, or a small pair of scissors to position that double folded hem edge under the needle, and very carefully lower the needle halfway across the fold to anchor it in place. Turn the material by about 45 degrees to the right. Take the raw edge a few inches in front of the needle and begin drawing it through the hammer, moving the rest of the fabric as little as possible. It should start to roll. As you get closer to the portion already anchored in place by the needle, carefully move the rear of the fabric back straight, which should hopefully firm up that roll and connect it to the folded portion at the rear. I'm really sorry if I've just made this overly complicated. Once positioned, take a hold of both the upper and lower threads with your hand at the back and slowly begin to stitch forward using tension from the threads to assist in advancing the material. The same quantity of material should be kept in the hammer at all times. 
Too much will result in an uneven hem, possibly even with the raw edge of the fabric being forced back out again. Too little will mean that the hem cannot be rolled properly and you'll just end up with a raw edge. It does take practice. Until you can gauge the distances by eye, you can mark a line half an inch from your edge and align this with the inside edge of your hammer foot. The stitch line won't be on this half inch mark, it's just a guideline. The principle of this hammer is very much like the small hammer foot, except larger and adjustable. With it, you may hem from 3 16ths of an inch up to 1 inch in its assembled position, and when taken apart, larger hems can be sewn. The hem depth adjustment is made by loosening the thumb screw on the hammer and moving the slide to the right or left. There are numbers marked which correspond to 8 inch increments. After adjustment, be sure to tighten the adjustment screw fully so that your hem depth doesn't accidentally change while you're sewing. With the presser foot up, fold over and crease an eighth inch of fabric for about an inch or two and slip it into the hemmer and under the scale. Move the raw edge of the fabric back and forth against the left edge of the hemmer until the fabric starts to roll along that pre-folded edge. Then draw the fabric towards you, stopping with the end under the needle. and then lower the presser bar and commence to sew. Now I have this sample set up to do approximately a half inch hem. Though there is a pointer attached to the screw, I have found it more accurate to try to align the depth indicator numbers manually to the scroll underneath. The pointers on my attachments don't seem to align exactly to the correct number. We will align our pre-folded edge with the number 4 as the marks are in 16th inch increments and each full digit representing an eighth of an inch. But we must also take into consideration the additional eighth inch turnover for the rolled hem. This means that the raw edge of the fabric will align with the number 5 in order to roll under and form a half inch hem. And now it's just a case of sewing. I have had the best success when keeping the fabric snug against the inside right tongue of the attachment. As before, be careful to guide the fabric as to keep the hemmer at the optimum fullness and also be careful to start with even aligning of your fabric and hem as a seam that runs to the bias will become distorted and misaligned. To make a hem more than one inch wide, Take out the thumb screw in the hemmer, remove the pointer, and remove the slide. As part of the guide which forms the hem is now missing, you must either separately fold and crease or iron your fabric, or try using the edge guide to keep the distances uniform. I hope this guide to what I feel are the most common sewing machine attachments has been insightful and that you now feel well equipped to pour out the contents of the next sewing machine drawer you encounter and see what genius gadgets are hiding in it. Happy sewing!